So our next speaker is Tom Gubbins from Tamania Angus. Uh, so Tom is director of Tamania Angus. So Tamania Angus, as a uh, seed stock business, has been in the making for 90 years. There's approximately 2,000 cows now in the breeding herd, uh, spread around Australia in different locations, and mainly based out of Mortlake in Victoria. Tom's got a background in software engineering as well as uh, through agriculture for a significant amount of time. So he's got two nice backgrounds that's going to come behind his messages and what Tom's going to tell us about this afternoon. I'll just move this up onto the... Okay. Yes, um, firstly, a software engineer might be a, long, a bit of a long haul call, but perhaps identifying... Um, Areas where software can be developed and then um, finding people to develop it is probably. Um, so um, um, thank you for having me here this afternoon. And um, it, I've had a, it's been a great uh, beef week um, while I've been up here. Um, so Tamania Angus is a family business. And um, we have, um, as um, Andrew said, uh, 2,000 cows. Um, some in Mortlake and some on contract um, at Mansfield in, in northeastern Victoria. It's a Mediterranean climate, about 28 inches, and um, we had a fair few of them last night. So um, well, we're having a pretty good day today. As long as, um, but unfortunately, the temperature went from mid 20s. We had a chill factor of five degrees yesterday, and all the cattle were cold. So coming out of a drought, um, the orders were this morning to start feeding everything just to. Give them, give them a bit of sugar level. So um, Terry um, particularly wanted me to talk about cell grazing bulls. Um, the, we've been cell grazing at uh, our Mortlake property since um, 2002. Um, it was previously under cell grazing management um, by James Weatherly, that, um, and we took on that, and the manager at the time on the property came up and did an RCS course, and um, we continued on. Um, we uh, like to graze bulls in very large contemporary groups um, and the reason we do this is so that um, we can uh, get better genetic information. So the variation in animals in a large contemporary group is more due to the, the genetics in the animals rather than the environmental influences. Um, it's not conventional to raise um, animals in large contemporary, bulls in large contemporary groups because, as you'd know, bulls at uh, seven months became, become uh, sexually active and they fight and ride each other and um, um, a mob can... socialisation can be very easily disrupted. So things that upset the social behaviour in, a bull, in bulls is um, um, numerous. We have uh, lack of feed... Um, is number one probably as soon as um, they are short and that's according to them, not us. Um, they start, um, behave, their social um, interaction gets disrupted. Uh, no water obviously, sudden temperature changes, storms, full moons, acute corners in paddocks, um, such as a cell centre, which is a good example. So the bulls that uh, are ridden or fought um, with are normally both at the same time will walk around the paddock and um, to avoid each other. But strangely, they don't walk off. They sort of, uh, they turn and rejoin the mob, probably because of the mob mentality or just the fact that they may even be going back to confront the bulliers. Um, to reduce or eliminate um, this from occurring, um, in the four or five mobs of um, 250 bulls that we have, we have to ride them uh, and check them all the time. The advantages of this, though, um, albeit perhaps at a cost, uh, is that they're very good gauges of the current fire, um, environmental situation. So we can see that uh, which species of pasture and compositions um, are affecting them um, and uh, learn a lot about um, behaviour and climatic conditions. And it's a little bit, um, I suppose, it's a little bit like a, a dairy vat. Um, as a barometer daily on um, how things are sort of functioning out there. Um, the cell centre becomes an advantage as well because we actually um, sell, uh, graze two cells at the same time, opposing one another across the middle of the cell centre. So as a bullied bull walks into the cell centre, it'll walk, it can walk straight out the other side, often leaving some of the bulls at the trough. So we, tr um, we, try and sell, uh, we try and finish the bulls up to, um, up to the point of um, 
uh, sale, but obvious auction bulls we have to take out of the cell system um, a few months before sale and feed them on a, um, a total mixed ration. Um, we have attempted to try and sell bulls that have been paddock reared, but um, our clients, even though they tell us they want that to happen, when we do it, they don't buy them. So um, we've sort of given up that. We're going to do it our way and tell them that's the way that we're going to do it. So the um, next thing I wanted to talk about was um, some of our um, uh, data collection um, systems that um, Sapien Technology has developed um, in conjunction with some of our requirements. So um, Tamania collects lots of um, information in, from um, several different locations contracted growers, Team Tamania, progeny test herds, and um, with the help of um, the, the cool software, Robert and Claire Wild um, have helped us um, create a cloud-based recording system so that um, information can be loaded up from all sorts of geographical locations and be synchronised into one single cloud database in Melbourne. Um, cool Collect is a standalone computer software program um, that um, uh, that collects we collect about forty different uh, more than forty different traits on, um, and we then collate that for genetic analysis. This gives us the ability to collect data over lots of different locations, and then that um, uh, is given to Mania Angus um, um, what's arguably the largest genetic reference population in Australia now, which um, has been. We've been used um, as uh, um, our data has been used a lot in collect in um, developing genomic tools that um, um, you're seeing being rolled out and commercialised at the moment, such as the single step methodology, um, which is going to change the face of our business and the way it functions. It's going to be a very disruptive technology for the benefit of beef producers. Um, we're hoping that soon it's going to be, you know, with the data that we're collecting, we're going to be able to estimate the commercial value of steers prior to selling them. So the next, uh, we also collect uh, carcass data um, through the same system, and that gives us the opportunity to be able to um, benchmark uh, these um, animals. So this is a, a feedback sheet which is um, benchmarking, which is... Um, um, collating uh, marble score against, um, uh, in this case, uh, cow, cow age, weaning weight, weaning age, induction age and induction weight to give uh, the feedlot some information about how to, he might be able to improve mus um, um, marbling score environmentally. Uh, the next one um, is... Um, benchmarking uh, between clients. So uh, the green line, can everyone see that green flat line? It's very, probably quite small, is the, um, is the report average. Um, the red line is the feedlot average for um, marbling in this case. And I'm concentrating on marbling at the moment because you prob probably, um, in our um, value proposition that we're providing to our clients, marbling is uh, a driving driver of, uh, of, the, of the steer price. Um, so the feedlot average is uh, fluctuating there below, and then each one of those bars is um, the compliance rate of each of the herds um, out of our team project that's um, um, supplying that particular feedlot. Uh, we also can, um, this is um, pool data from hospital pens, and you can see that um, one of the herds there herd, um, has, has, has so herd 69 has nearly 80% of their animals going into the hospital paddock. I'm not sure whether that's a, um, a statistical error or they're not, um, they were quite an ill-thrifty group of steers. But that information gives us... Uh, so looking for, um, hopefully, um, with, the, with things like pink eye information that we're collecting um, and uh, rumination that we're now doing with... Um, sense time, um, motion sensing animal um, tags that all flex um, are, are selling, we might be able to start doing autoimmune response and do heritabilities on that. The other, um, I'll just move along now to um, a farm management program that we're, we've um, been on beta stage with, with um, uh, the McDonald family and um, Cloncurry are also um, beta trialling this 
Um, it's, a far, it's a farm managing um, tool. So um, uh, what, uh, what, what happens is in, a, in um, sometimes jumbled life, um, this program is able, has really got all my job lists and things really structured for me. So um, Cool Note is an electronic um, farm notebook. I take photos of um, particular jobs um, and things around the farm, such as uh, service records, broken wires, bull holes, paddock, paddocks, uh, moves, messages to employees, spraying applications, uh, fertiliser applications and mob moves. Um, so I just simply take a photo and the GPS references where I was standing when I took the photo. You can take a photo of, um, of the um, drench drum that you might have used to drench and it'll pull down, download all the batch details. Um, and um, then once I get back to my office, um, the app syncs with the computer and I sit there on my PC and fill it all out. And then I can allocate jobs to people as from um, um, notifications or, that I've made to myself during the previous day. So that's uh, quite a, um, uh, an amazing tool that um, Sapien have been, uh, been developing. And um, um, so this is what the app looks like on your phone. It's all offline. Doesn't, you don't need to be online. You just sync it when you come back into, the, into range. Now, I'm not sure if I got, just uh, quickly, I don't know, how many people have used Google Docs and Sheets? So um, if you haven't had a bit of a play around with Google Sheets, we're sort of managing all of our reporting now to our staff on Google Sheets. So things like feeding animals, um, the calculations of the rations, all of that stuff is now um, sunk on everyone's phone. So I can make a change in, on my PC in the office and instantly the feed sheets change on everyone's phones. Um, if you haven't been playing around with those sorts of things, then um, you know, perhaps if you're that way inclined, it might be something that you quite enjoy and takes a bit of the load of communication of um, some of those things. Also Google Maps, we've now just got our farm map on Google Maps and so I can design new fences and give it to the contractor and he knows where to put them. So, um, this is, uh, I just wanted to quick talk briefly about the, we did a trial last year with a hundred of these um, uh, Fitbits for cows, I suppose. They're just, just a, a three-dimensional accelerometer that's uh, attached, it's on the animal. Uh, it can detect it walking, it can detect it ruminating, it can detect it panting. Um, and so, and, and quite a few other things um, that it can detect. So uh, what they do is they, they're recording observations with the animals on and then they compare their observations, um, thousands and thousands of observations taken by students in the paddock and they compare these observations to the data that's on there and they can see that when certain things happen on the, on the motion sensor, they are actually um, uh, walking or doing whatever they do. So basically when an animal walks, it bobs its head like that, when it ruminates, it twists its head like that and this thing can sense. And, um, and so from that we can get first estrus in heifers and um, this is a bit of a game changer for us because we're pushing growth rates so hard because it um, clearly uh, reduces um, gross feed intake, um, reduces um, maintenance in animals by having them to grow faster. But the negative consequences are that the maturity pattern goes out on the heifers and the cow size gets bigger. So this, this device here will control, will be able to give us a clear phenotype so that we can then start to work out a, geno, um, a, a genotypic um, score on, um, uh, set on sexual maturity so we can keep it low and have a yin and yang against um, growth rate, I suppose. So um, we're just in the process of working out how to put those on our 600 heifers this year so we can get first estrus and then possibly first estrus after calving, or we might just take them off and put them on next year's cohort. The um, other subject uh, that I was going to talk about today was um, uh, the biological program that we're doing on our, uh, on our pasture, and um, in, in this case here, removing bluegum stumps. Um, in Western Victoria and South Australia, Western Australia, we had a managed investment scheme that uh, incentivised farmers to sell their property or lease it to companies that managed um, tree plantations under them. 
Um, now the music stopped and um, the trees weren't worth as much as they uh, thought they were when they were planted because the companies that were planting them didn't really care about the price of the trees. All they wanted to do was invest people's money. So um, now we've got a situation in Western Victoria where we've got lots of areas that have got stumps on them and uh, that, that have to be removed uh, to get proper, uh, to get um, a functional pasture occurring again. So uh, many people have been deciding $800 a hectare to get a bulldozer or a grinder in and grind them all. Um, and we decided to not do that. Um, and we've decided that we're going to try and rot them out. And so um, we, uh, first of all, um, the, we, we cut, where the, the stumps were left, they were cut off at ground level, very, very hard to remove, and all the trash was left behind. So this is about what the paddock looks like. That's a pile of timber that's now um, was about, stood about that high and is now lying flat on the ground. All those um, sticks there um, uh, are very, uh, very rotten. Um, so we proactively decided to stimulate biology function to rot the trash and the stumps. Um, the most important thing that we did was we resisted burning it. Um, the burning um, seals off the outside of the timber and protects it from, um, from, from bacteria and fungi getting in and starting to rot it. We, um, we, had to, we sprayed the stumps uh, to stop the... the um, trees from regrowing. We had to spray them with Ally and Roundup mix twice, uh, one year apart, and that killed the trees. Um, which, and then we set about um, possibly repairing some of the damage when we used Roundup. Um, <laughs> and uh, we then sprayed it with a decomposing product which, um, uh, to put the right biology in place, which was um, produced for mulching stubble uh, in cereal crops. Um, then we spread compost and cheap seed, um, brome and clover to create a, a microclimate down at the ground level to, um, and for the, something that, for the cows to eat. Um, the cows grazed, uh, this, grazed this in early autumn and, um, main, and summer. Um, then the, the, the idea was to wait for 10 years. Uh, we're up to year seven, 90% uh, of the remaining sticks uh, can, be, can be broken by hand um, and 50% of the stumps can be hit out with a hammer. Um, I'm hoping that next year we're going to be able to plough it and roughly so. The pros are low cost, uh, greater carbon retention, nutrients build over time before sowing. So I was concerned that if we actually did harvest them, or do, did rip all the stumps out and burn it in rows, that the nutrient um, uh, value of the soil would be so damaged after coming out of forest or tree plantation that we'd have trouble growing pasture anyway. So um, the time to re-establish the pasture may have been sort of half the 10-year program anyway. Um, and so uh, the cons um, was t um, time mustering cost, which I fixed by purchasing a um, Phantom 4, which drone, which was a lot of fun, and uh, we got the cows out of, the, out of these 600 acre paddocks that way. Uh, we believe that after 10 years we'll have the same production on the area and without the cost of heavy machinery and about $800 cost, capital cost of removing the stumps. So one other, uh, so we, we buy compost, we buy it from a company called Biosys. Um, I, um, we, the technique um, uh, that we do is about buying it in. We don't make it on the farm, and I'll explain that in a minute, but um, we want uh, to increase uh, nutrient and water retention, um, and uh, I want the advantages of biodynamic farming, but I don't, and I want to sort of hybridise hybris that, or for want of a better word, um, to, to also have the economy of more conventional farming. But uh, what's happened is that we've gradually had a transition from soluble fertilisers into, into, um, into um, more um, biological-based fertilisers. And, um, and um, I suppose my father um, would be the barometer. He was um, a little bit concerned about his son when he started putting out those sorts of things. And uh, so he's been very helpful for me to be able to observe the, um, at a, uh, the differences in animal um, health and behaviour over time. 
So this year we spread uh, 3,500 tonnes of compost on 20, uh, 2,700 hectares. So the compost is made from, bed, uh, from um, pig bedding and, um, and here's a photo of it being turned uh, to, man to manage its, uh, the, co the, the, the temperature of it mainly. Uh, so we test it, we, we test the compost before, after we've ordered it and what we've put the chemistry requirements that we want in it, then we test it before delivery to make sure that it's actually what we wanted. Um, and that's the beauty of buying it in because if you make it and it doesn't work, which it can happen, um, then you don't have to uh, incur the cost of it. Um, spreading is more expensive. Um, we're buying in the nutrients. I calculate the nutrients by by comparing it to soluble fertiliser still, so the nutrients I'd buy for the same amount of money that I'd spend on compost, and it's about even, except the compost uh, that I buy in is not as soluble as soluble fertiliser, um, but, I'm ho uh, but the, we're also buying in the biology that stimulates that um, organic nutrients to become sol solubilised, and that's what I want to try and achieve. So uh, this is, these are tests over time. The first uh, two are a paddock, um, uh, um, a paddock site that we allocated to monitor it. And you can see that, uh, you probably can't actually, um, but um, what it's showing is that the biodiversity, the, um, the water retention, um, the carbon levels are significantly improving in, the, in, in a seven year period. Um, and also down the bottom, the chemistry of the, uh, of the country has significantly ch shifted as well. So we're very happy with the results and um, I can't see any reason why we would falter in progressing further with it. Um, so our business is uh, we, collect genetic, we collect data and um, we crunch it into a, into a genotype using um, Armidale University's um, um, algorithm breed plan to make an EBV and we use those EBVs for our breeding decisions and that improves the outcome and the economic improvement for our clients is the result. So I don't know if I've got time really to go into um, how we, how we, all the joinings that we do are computerised now. Um, we don't do any uh, joinings that um, so this is a, um, a, an, um, a graph of um, the iterating program TGRM we use. It has two frontiers. It has um, co-ancestry on one, on one side and it has profitability on the other, an index that we create out of all the traits that we select. And so it's driving profit up and, and co-ancestry co down. Um, and so it just randomly joins the 2,000 animals to a cohort of bulls that we've selected and um, after, about a mil after about 20 to 30 million iterations, um, that line stops wiggling and it comes to a point where it can't randomly s make a, a joining that is any better than one of the previous ones it's already done. So it sits there and doesn't move anymore and that's the joining we use. So um, don't go out of the room and say that Tamania randomly joined their cows because that, but that's what sort of we do, but we just do it on a computer system um, about 20 or 30 million times to, um, and then choose the better one. Uh, so before we actually make the decision to join, it shows us uh, all the production figures. It shows us the bell curve on birth weight, uh, growth, marbling, cow size, fertility, uh, and then we can make a decision whether perhaps we've got too many animals with too heavy a birth that are going to be born. So we know prior to them being born what the distribution of the, of the traits will be. All right, so that concludes my talk. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, hopefully I've, I've left a few loose ends. Thanks,